I said, I'm going to write a story, two stories a week, and within a year, I'll have a book. And now let's go ahead and chat with today's featured guest. He is the beloved originator of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series and has fostered the emergence of inspirational anthologies as a genre and watched it grow to a billion dollar market. As the driving force behind the development and delivery of more than 123 million books sold through the Chicken Soup for the Soul franchise and over 500 million copies worldwide, my guest today is uniquely qualified to talk about success. He's been a featured guest on more than 1,000 radio and television programs in nearly every major Major market worldwide and is a multiple New York Times bestselling author. It is my pleasure to welcome Jack Canfield to the show. Jack, super stoked to be here with you. Why don't you go ahead and start us off by telling us what you're most excited about right now? Probably what I'm most excited about is I've spent the last 50 years training people to be more successful. Started out in the high school classrooms and then I started training teachers and then they did you know general public seminars and so forth. And now I'm training trainers. We've got um, about 3,000 trainers from over 100 countries around the world wow. that we've trained. And uh, we are now doing online training for the first time the last two years. I was in the Gulf in places like Oman and Kuwait and Bahrain and, wow. and Iran and you know, was it, Dubai, all these places. And all these people said, we can't come to America to get trained. We can't even get visas, let alone pay for the travel and yeah. do all that. So we decided to put it online, and, and now we've got people in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Ukraine, uh, Sudan, whatever, teaching these principles. So getting the word out about that, which thank you for helping me do by asking me that question, of and also being able to do that and, and just change the world, because I, I think nobody should be suffering. Hmm. You know, there, We know too much now for people to be suffering, whether it's mentally, emotionally, spiritually, or physically. So that's what I'm committed to. My life purpose statement is to inspire and empower people to live their highest vision in a context of love and joy. If anybody has literally committed their life to doing that, it would definitely be Jack Canfield. So Thank you. now you weren't always one of the best-selling authors of all time. So let's take it back here, go back to the, the very beginning of all of this. So I'll go all the way back to when I was in college, I got a C in, in, in freshman composition. Freshman so, composition. So <laughs> No one predicted I would be a best So you're not author. a writer then. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I <laughs> yeah. guess I became one. <laughs> yeah. You learned. Yeah. Yes, I did. <laughs> um, okay, so rewind a little bit even further back from that. Sure. And uh, talk to me about like, was this always something that was on your heart growing up? Like, I know that you said that your, uh, your, your dad and, and your parents, your stepdad growing up had limiting beliefs about money right. and different things like that. So it was, was, were those programmed into your brain? Did you have to do a lot of mental reprogramming? I did. I, was, I, was, I grew up kind of in the hippie period of the 60s, and I was like against big business. And people that have money must have screwed somebody to get it kind mm -hmm. of mentality. Yeah. And um, I met W. Clement Stone when I was in Chicago in graduate school. And he was, uh, he wrote a book called um, The Success System That Never Fails. He was good friends with Napoleon Hill, who wrote Think and Grow Rich. Mm -hmm. And I started studying with him, uh, weekend workshops and so forth, and totally changed my mind. He just, I never forget him saying, success is not a four-letter word. Meaning it's not a bad right. thing. Yeah. And you know, the more money you have, the more good you can do. One of Bob Proctor's great quotes is, if you don't have money, the good you can do is limited to your physical presence. If you have money, you can do good all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so I began to realize, and I grew up in a middle class world where I thought, you know, if I just go to college and get a job, I'll be a good guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got to college, I got involved in a civil rights movement. I started to wake up in terms of liberation and, and, and fairness and, and everyone should have a shot at, at success. Yeah. And I began to realize, wow, I would like to have all that as well. You know, live in the big house and have a nice car and have money to travel and do education and take care of my family. So you initially started as an educator, right? Yes. So you you weren't planning on going to some big university, but then all of a sudden you had a teacher that pushed you. Can you talk us through like how that? Yeah, I was happened? I was going to this school in West Virginia, which is not known for its education systems, <laughs> and my Latin teacher uh, decided I was you know maybe more gifted than a lot of kids and. She said to me one day, where are you going to apply to college? I said, I don't know, Ohio State, West Virginia University. She says, well, I can get you into West Virginia University with a letter because she was well-known in that world. And she said, you need to apply to some Ivy League schools. And I thought, you're crazy. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but I applied to Harvard, Yale, and Brown, and uh, also just 
believe she could get me to West Virginia. I got into all three, which was surprising to me. And I also got an appointment to West Point in Annapolis, which I decided oh, wow. not to do. Um, but I ended up at Harvard and um, majored in Chinese history, which has nothing to do with what I do Chinese today. Chinese history. It just yeah. proves I can uh, study hard on things that you know are challenging and persevere. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So during that time, what was like the biggest deciding factor for you? Like why Harvard? Well, was there anything that stood out? This is embarrassing, or? but what stood out for me was there were about 25 girls schools within 15 miles. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and I had gone to an all boys school. All Nothing high embarrassing school. about that. Yeah. And I just thought, <laughs> you know, it's a big city. It's near yeah. Boston. It's not isolated. And uh, everyone always just said Harvard was the kind of, you know, pinnacle of the whole thing. So why not? Cool. Cool. So in Harvard, you major in Chinese history. Then what happens after that? My senior year, my roommate took a course called Sock Rel 10, Social Relations 10. And, um, and then he took another course in psych. And he said, these are really cool. You should take them. So I took this course. It turned into be what we called back then an encounter group. We just sat around and talked about our feelings and learned about relationships. And I had none of that. I mean, I grew up in a very, a family that was extremely, didn't, talk about their feelings in an all-boys school where you had to be macho, and then you go to Harvard, it's an all-boys school back then, you had to be macho. And this was like new, but I, I woke up. It was like, I want to do this. I want to help people discover who they really are, develop their human potential. And with a degree in Chinese history, that wasn't really easy to get into graduate <laughs> school. So my advisor said, well, why don't you go into education as if you're going to teach history, and then while you're in graduate school in education, you can take ed psych and psych courses, and that's what I did. Okay. And I taught in an all-black inner city school for, two, for a year. And what I discovered, I became more interested in motivating my students than I was in teaching history. Hmm. And that's when I discovered there was this guy named W. Clement Stone who had a foundation where they were teaching people how to help kids achieve more through psychology. So more heart knowledge than head knowledge, kind of? Yeah, say? I mean, the head's involved, but the heart is more important, absolutely. Yeah. And, and we need both, heart and head. And um, when those are integrated, then you have people that are really functioning at a high level. So then you go to this foundation, and the guy that's running this basically becomes your first mentor, right? Correct. Okay, and what kind of relationship were you, did you like was it was it pretty formal in the fact that like you sat down with him and you'd go over goals and stuff like that or was it just kind of like I didn't spend all that much time with him I did spend some time with him but most of the time I spent with the guy that he put in charge of his foundation a guy named Dr. Billy Sharp who was okay. a, a real genius and then there were three other people all PhD psychologists who were really bright and they just took me under their wing and just mentored me yeah. and then I got time with Stone as well I'll never forget probably the most profound conversation we had, we were literally from the elevator at the top of the building down to the first floor. Okay. And I said, Mr. Stone, you know, I'm fairly radical, you know, leftist Democrat, you know, <laughs> and you're a totally conservative right Republican, and yet we get along really well. Why? And he said, you know, he drew two circles, and he just, two circles, was a little bit of overlap like this. Mm -hmm. And he said, we don't agree on this, and we don't agree on that. But we both agree that we need to be educating people in the inner city and empowering them to get out of the ghetto and blah, 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 blah. So all I want to do is spend my time with you on that. There's no reason to talk about anything else. Hmm. And that really transformed the way I look at people that don't agree with everything. I do, well, what can we agree on and what can we get done? And let's not waste our time. Yeah. That was profound. And then his other thing was he just taught me goal setting, values, visualization, affirmation, perseverance, and do it now. He, he, he came up with do it now way before uh, Nike did. Way before Nike. Yeah. <laughs> um, and just for some context here for somebody watching or listening that may not know who that is, can you give a little bit of context? Sure. He, he was a guy who did not go to college. He later got a college degree after he became wealthy. He just wanted to complete that for himself. But he sold newspapers on the street. He was really, really poor. He took a job as a salesperson in an insurance company. He just rocked the world. He just knew mm -hmm. how to sell. Yeah. And he studied. And um, so eventually he started his own insurance company, Combined Insurance. And he then was the publisher of Success Magazine, which is now the big, used to be a small like Reader's Digest size. Okay. He published that. He had a company called Hawthorne uh, uh, Publishing, where he did publish all these books. Um, the guy that wrote The Greatest Salesman That Ever Lived, mm -hmm. um, Augmentino, Augmentino yeah. was the editor of, of the Success uh, Magazine, no worked in the same mm -hmm. building I did. So mm -hmm. I would go up in the evenings because Og burned the midnight oil and so did I. <laughs> I got mentored by him. That wow, was incredible. Awesome. So I was just surrounded by these, these, these gurus of positive belief and take action and anything's possible. And it was um, very, very cool. This guy was worth... 
he was worth six hundred million dollars in the nineteen seventy, so he would have been a billionaire by today's yeah. inflationary standards. For sure, for yeah. sure. Um, what we're going to touch on some of that stuff a little bit later. I, I kind of want to continue along like sure. the whole life story thing sure. because there's so much networking little things that you're just talking about as far as mentorship and stuff like that goes. But um, so now moving along from here, you are teaching in the inner city, and mm-hmm. then did, did you get a job at at, the, at a college or something as a professor after that? Well, what happened? I, I worked. I worked at that school. Then this professor from Harvard started a program at a XVA hospital that turned into what was called a job course center, where kids who had dropped out of school ended up getting job training. Okay. And so I was there, part of like a four-person Young Turks out of education school team. We were doing radical stuff. We started. We were the first people to create individualized learning. We actually took the Sullivan reading program where you go, A sounds like apple or grape, you know, mm-hmm. and we put the instruction was a teacher does on tape recorders so every kid could move at their own pace. And now everyone does that in their computers. We mm-hmm. were the first guys to do that. So then I went from there back to uh, Chicago for a year, worked at the Stone Foundation some more, and then I went to uh, the University of Massachusetts. There was a professor I met at the Got conference it. who said, we would love to have you in graduate school. I said, I can't, I don't want to, pay that money right now. He said, we'll give you a full scholarship. Gave me a full scholarship, made me a teaching assistant. So I taught for a while. Then I had a teaching job at Hampshire College, which is also in Amherst, Massachusetts. I was at University of Mass in Amherst. And then I'm writing, I'm, I'm at my doctorate level and I just got arrogant. Like, I don't need the damn PhD. Hmm. I'm already, I wrote a book by then called 100 Ways to Enhance Self-Concept in the Classroom. I was getting consulting jobs back then at 300 a day, which was a lot. I was going to say, so the, that book that you wrote at that time, mm-hmm. like, sold a lot of copies. 400,000 copies. That's crazy. Yeah, That's it, crazy. It, it, like, it changed my whole perception of who I was, what yeah. could be done with a book. And I started one getting... One of those big goals that you always talk about. Yeah. Right? Like, one of the the life marker goals. Yeah. And I had this professor who was a best selling author named Sid Simon. And, and I said, I want to go up and be like you. He mm-hmm. said, well, here's how I did it. And so one of the things I teach if you're, you're networking and mentoring is like, ask people that have done what you want to do, how they did it. You know, Keith Ferrazzi wrote a book called Never Eat Alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it's like every meal, you could invite someone to join you or you could have lunch with them or you could go for a walk. So I used to go with this professor. He was a hiker. And um, and just ask questions. And you'd be surprised how many people will say yes. But anyway, so it sold 400,000 copies. So I left school, and I started a, a, a growth center. It's a okay. place where people go for weekend workshops. And we had 11 acres of land just right outside of Amherst. And we put on about 40 weekend workshops a year, most oh, wow. of which I took if I wasn't leading them. Okay. And so I got just like about a 10-year education that was insane. So you were hosting them. Right, but and participating in them, them. right? Because I spent all my money taking workshops at other centers. I <laughs> ran out of money. I said the only way I can do this is if I bring people in. Yeah, and it started in the Holiday Inn because that's all I could afford. And then I eventually got married, and we bought a house that had a thirty by thirty living room. We could run workshops in. Okay, it. and um, that it just evolved out of that. Uh, it says so much though, just about resourcefulness, just in and of itself. Because a lot of people would just run out of money and then just be like, "All right, well, that was fun." Right. And then like, and then it's done, you know, but right. you, instead of doing that, were like, I love doing this. I want to continue to learn about this, this, and this, but I, I, I don't have the money to do it right now. So right. I'll just host them and then exactly. be a part of them <laughs> or yeah, the other thing learn you, for free. The other yeah. thing you can do is so many people now run seminars. They need mm-hmm. assistance, people to hand out the Kleenex, to yeah. register people at the door, to hand out the crayons, whatever right. it is. And so I did some of that along the way as well. Yeah. Really cool. Really cool. So now you have an actual education company, basically, right, where you're right. running these workshops and everything mm-hmm. like that. At what point does the chicken soup for the soul come out of this whole thing? I was running around doing the workshops, but also doing a lot of speaking. Okay. And I learned in my inner city classrooms that the only time the kids really paid attention was when I was telling a story. If I was telling a historical fact or the five causes of the Civil War or whatever, they're like, zoned out. Yeah, totally. But if I would tell a story about an escaped slave or if I'd tell a story and I began to realize these kids didn't believe they could be successful. So I started reading Jet and um, Ebony Magazine and looking for stories of African Americans who'd made it, hmm. you know, who were corporate people, successful lawyers, whatever. And I would bring those to school and I'd read them to them. I'd put them on the bulletin board and that's what they were like, whoa, you, someone like me did that? Yeah, yeah. And so I saw the power of stories. So I just started collecting inspirational, motivational stories. And as I was doing my seminars after I'd started, um, you know, the, the company called Self Esteem Seminars, mm-hmm. it became the Camfield Training Group. Now, 
I would tell these stories to inspire people. And people would come up and say, that's a story about the Girl Scout who sold 3,000 boxes of Girl Scout cookies. Is that in a book anywhere? My daughter needs to read it. A story about the guy who climbed Mount Everest who was blind. Is that in a book anywhere? And I go, no, no, <laughs> no. And one day it was like God was knocking me yeah. on the head saying, hey, put those stories in a book. How many right. times do I have to have people ask right. me this question? <laughs> so I literally on the plane coming back from Boston to L.A. at the time, I wrote down every story I knew. It came out to 70 stories. Wow. And so I said, I'm going to write a story two stories a week and within a year I'll have a book and that's what happened then toward the end of that I met Mark Victor Hansen at a breakfast and he asked me what I was doing what I was excited about and I told him he said uh, I want to do that with you and I said Mark that's like telling you know James Mishner he's three quarters done with the book Hawaii yeah. <laughs> and you want to finish it with him why would he let you do that and he said well first of all you took a lot of stories that are mine and you use them and secondly he said I got a lot of stories you never heard and, I, and he said, you need 101 stories. That's a spiritual number. He had done an internship in India when he was in college. Okay. So I said, well, if you can find 31 stories, we'll do it. And he did. And it was a great match because he's much more of a marketer, promoter okay. than I was at the time. And I was much more of a detail guy. So it became a great marriage for the yeah. time we, we did it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the biggest things. I don't know if you can talk about that for a second, but um, finding strategic partnerships sure. and changing from being a solopreneur to building out a team. Can you talk about that just for a second? Yeah. Get you, back on the story. I, I, I would just say to every solopreneur, start with at least an assistant. Hmm. You know, and if you can partner up with someone to do the things you don't love to do. Do you know who Dan Sullivan is with Strategic mm -hmm. Coach? Good, mm -hmm. good friend of mine as well. And we took his program. And he talks about every entrepreneur has a genius. You know, and, and mine has to do with aggregating things, whether it's tech activities, techniques, stories, people and um and and but there are other things i'm not really great at and so find those people that love to do what you don't love to do and stop doing the stuff you don't love and mm -hmm. then just you have more time to focus on bringing your core genius your 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 kuleana as the hawaiians say your right yeah. livelihood into the world and so and the thing you have to do is, is you have to really understand they're going to be different than you and they're not always going to agree with you there are times i wanted to like punch mark in the face <laughs> you know and there's times he wanted to pull my hair out um but we really acknowledged that we both brought things that neither of us could do alone yeah. to the table. And um, so all these typologies, you know, whether it's Myers-Briggs or the Enneagram or whatever you mm -hmm. discovered are different types of people. And you need all of those to make a team. I have 12 staff now and, you know, all the bases are covered. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's I feel like that was the biggest mistake that I made when I was forming a partnership with somebody was... I made the mistake of finding somebody that had a lot of the same strengths as I did because right. I was just like, oh, we'll just double down on these things that we're right. really good at. And it just didn't work at all because like you said, like we're, we're the same. We have the same exact strengths. So the things yeah. that we're both weak on, now nobody's picking up that slack and now yep. it's just a total dead partnership. Yep. Um, but yeah, I, just, I wanted to touch on that for a second before we move into the rest of the sure. story. So partner up with Mark Richard Hansen and you write the book. You said that um, you did a lot of meditation, that both of you did a lot of meditation to try to come up with a name for the book. Yeah, yeah. Right? And you guys were really stoked about it, but then the publishers that you called weren't that yeah. stoked about it. <laughs> well, what happened was we didn't have a title. and We had an agent. We were going to go to New York with this agent that we uh -huh. met at a conference and uh, said, we can't, put, pub we can't push the book without a title. Yeah. So Mark and I are both meditators. So we said, well, let's meditate for a week and see so what we come up with. So I just would close my eyes and say, you know, God, I'm, a, I'm open to a title. And nothing happened for two and a half days. And then on Wednesday morning, third day, this big chalkboard appeared. And a hand came out and wrote the words chicken soup on it in my mind. And I said to the hand, um, what the hell does chicken soup have to do with this book? <laughs> and the voice said, when you were sick as a child, your grandmother gave you chicken soup. I said, but this is not a book about sick people. <laughs> it sounds delicious. but He says, yeah. and, and so the voice said, people's spirits are sick. They're living in resignation, hopelessness, and fear. And this was the first Gulf War in 1993. So it was like the recent recession we had. And we had like, you know, 30, 40% unemployment. A lot of places, people's incomes were way down. People were being laid off. So I went chicken soup for the spirit. No, chicken soup for the soul. I got goosebumps. Called Mark. He got goosebumps. Told my wife she got goosebumps. Our agent got goosebumps. We went to New York. 21 meetings in three days. And nobody got goosebumps. <laughs> and they said, it's just a dumb title. And... Um, so we ended up going to the Book Expo America, which is where all the bookstore owners come for their big convention. All the publishers are there. We went booth to booth to booth for three days. And on the third day, after I think about 144 rejections, one person said, well, we'll look at it. <laughs> and three days later, they said, we'll publish it. 
and said, we're going to advance, no advance, uh, <laughs> but we'll give you 20 cents of every dollar that we bring in. And the book went on to sell over 10 million copies in the U.S. and wow. probably about 100 million around the world now, as you said in the intro, half a billion books sold in, yeah, exactly. I think it's 48 countries now. I like how you said it was about 144 rejections, even though you knew the exact number, because <laughs> like, yeah. you knew exactly how many people turned you down. For- I, we kept track, yeah. yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I actually really found, I recently found all the rejection letters. Oh, really? And it took everything in me not to just staple a best selling a bestseller list for times <laughs> and just send them back. Yeah. And I thought that is totally vindictive, Jack. Do not do that. You're, yeah. you're better than that. Yeah. So you told somebody else to do it for you. <laughs> no, I didn't. We just get it. Okay, so I want to I want to ask you about that because this is one thing that I think separates a lot of successful people from a lot of not successful people mm-hmm. is the ability to push past the no yeah. and not fear the next time you ask. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about how how to be persistent without being really annoying to the people that you're talking to. Because I feel like there's a difference between pushy persistence and professional persistence. And when you do it the right way, you get a good response. You do it the wrong way, you get a negative response. Would you agree with that? If not, can you I think, talk about that? Well, I think one of the things is important. If you're coming from desperation, mm-hmm. I mean, if you ever walked into a house, someone has a dog and the dog comes up and starts jumping all over you and humps your leg and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. And like a, a lot of people, when they're presenting their idea, especially or they're selling something, especially if they really need it, uh, they come off like that, and you want to push that away. Um, if you come with passion and start with your why, as Simon Sinek says, then what happens, people can get excited about your passion. Hmm. And so, you know, one of the things I teach an exercise in my seminars called the nine no's exercise, where people have to mill around and they have to ask for something that would really help them in their career. Mm-hmm. And then everyone you ask, they have to keep track of how many no's they give, and the 10th person they say yes to. And what people learn from that is the no that's not personal because they just they weren't in a position to say yes, mm-hmm. you know. And it takes a, it's a numbers game, you know. As we found that time it was 144. I've done mm-hmm. other things that took longer than that, yeah. but there's always someone out there. Uh, there's a yes for everything in the universe. Um, one of the stories I tell is about this student I had who wanted to start a company and couldn't get any banks or investment people or anything. Mm-hmm. He rode the train back and forth from. Grandish, Connecticut to New York and everyone that got on the train he did this all day long he'd say are you a qualified investor and if he said yes he said do you mind if I pitch you an idea he did that for 31 days wow. and on day 32 he sold this idea and started this company so the question is how committed are you there's a yes out there hmm. um, so we would have self-published if we had to I didn't want to I didn't really want to be a publisher and a warehouser and have to go out to Costco and tell them I should buy right, a book right. but I would have if we'd done it and I think what happened is that this one publisher, they were so moved by our passion yeah, and they were willing to take a risk because there was no genre of short, short stories up until then didn't sell, books of short stories. The reason was they were all fiction. These were true stories. It, mm. it, was, it yeah. created a new genre. You see all kinds of those books now. Yeah, totally. totally. They're all over the place. Yeah. Um, what would you say, like during that time when you were getting a, a bunch of just rejections, 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 mm-hmm. Was there was there ever a time specifically with the name where you were like, "Hey, we're open to workshopping the name if you'll you know come with us on this," or was it just always like, no, "I this is the I name? I trusted the name," and yeah. everyone we talked to that wasn't a publisher loved the name. You know? okay. So, and this was what was happening too. I knew people loved the stories. <laughs> I get standing ovations. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. um, people in New York uh, were more jaded. There's a more cynical attitude toward feel good stuff. You know, mm-hmm. syrupy and nicey nice, Pollyanna, all that kind of stuff. Um, but another thing that happened, this was critical too, and people should know, it goes back to being creative. Mm-hmm. I said to one publisher, when people give you a no, one of the questions that's really valuable is what would have to happen for you to say yes? Yeah, That's a killer question. And this one publisher said, we'd need to know we could sell 20,000 copies. If we could sell 20,000 copies, that covers all our costs for developing, printing, typesetting, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So I said, so if I can prove to you that? He said, Yeah. So for the next six months, everywhere Mark and I went, we put a piece of paper on every seat in every audience, 100 people, 1,000 people, and it said, I promise to buy X number of copies of Chicken Soup of the Soul when it's published. Those are addresses before emails, I think. And so what happened was when we got 20,000 promises to buy, mm-hmm. a couple of bankers' boxes full of these things, one guy promised to buy 1,000 copies. Oh, wow. We took them down to the publisher and said, look. Yeah. And so that's part of why I think when we finally met him at the conference again on day three, he said yes. So you did all of that before this conference. Yes. So you got 144 no's with 20,000 people saying, we'll buy your book. Yes. 
wow, that's incredible. Was there, was there a point in there where you were just like completely frustrated with people? Like, like I, I have people who want to buy this book. I just need you to publish it. And they were still saying, no, I feel like I would just be so frustrated. Like, like yeah. do you understand what's, <laughs> like, what I, you're saying? I, I don't story? remember having that feeling. I just, yeah. it was kind of like next, 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 okay. next, yeah. next, next. You know, it's just like knocking someone, on doors. Someone, so what, next, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like um, Brian Tracy said, if you want your kids to grow up really powerful, make sure they do door-to-door sales at least for one summer. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. You know, you I've, realize after a while. That's what I've done for six years. Yeah. So. <laughs> but see, you're there because yeah. what you realize is there's always a yes somewhere. Mm-hmm. And you're yeah. going to get a lot of rejections. And then well, over time, what happens, because we, when, we, when the book came out, we started calling multi-level marketing companies because they could buy big batches of the mm-hmm. books. Yeah. We got hung up on. We got, you know, people like we couldn't even get the whole word out and the people would hang up on us, yeah. you know. But eventually one company said yes. They got a thousand books. They hired me as a keynote speaker. Oh, wow. I was able to then go and say to another company, we just did this with Discovery Toys. And so um, you when, once you know there's a cycle of like maybe you get a yes out of every 10 no's or 25 no's or whatever it is, then, then you, you have that experience. Yeah. But if you don't have it, most people give up after you know, like five or six no's. I was talking right. to a, senator, a state senator in New Jersey and they have to fundraise literally a couple hours a day, mm-hmm. every year, all day, all day long. And she said after five or six no's, she just gave up. But after she did that nine no's exercise, yeah. she says, now I just, I, did, I go for no. Don't even think about know? it. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. I think people just give up on too small of a sample size. There you go. Like they, they talk to seven people and they're like, oh, well, Never mind, you know. Exactly. Like, I talked to the market, and the market didn't want it. It's like, right. no, you take a took a way too small of a sample size right. of what the market is. One of my students is a ex con, and he now teaches people coming out of prison to be successful mm-hmm. using my principles and some of his own. And and one of the things you'll hear prisoners say, I can't get a job because now I've got a record. Well, how many jobs do you apply for? Ten. They all said no. So obviously, <laughs> no one's hiring a felon, you know, whatever. Right. And it's like, come on. Yeah, yeah. Ten <laughs> people without, people? Yeah. without <laughs> pe- criminal backgrounds have to ask more than that. Right. Usually. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, man, that's so funny. That, that That's one of the biggest things. I saw a video that you did recently. I think it might have been for Entrepreneur. It was for some uh, publication, mm-hmm. but about persistence. And it was like something that I really wanted to talk to you about since my background is all in door to door. Like I've done sure. a lot of door to door sales. I've managed a lot of teams of door to door sales. My company right now that I own has door to door sales reps. Yeah. So we've done a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, and that's, that's one of the biggest things that, that I've actually thought about since funny that, that you said that you said, Brian Tracy mm-hmm. said that yeah. everybody he had his son do that. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, that's to me what has given me the ability to like, to to go after interviews like this where right. i mean i've been in, in communication with people on your team for since september i think of mm-hmm. last year mm-hmm. you know what i mean so it took eight nine ten months of consistently reaching out being professional making sure that they they, they had everything i needed to be able to sit down and have the conversation that we're having right now right. and most people just like they reach out the one time and they get like a we'll be in touch answer and then it's just like okay and then that's it, and it never yeah. goes anywhere else. Well, just to look, just to speak at it from this side of the, you know, you calling in, what happens is someone like you calls back over and over, and it begins to be, we better do this for Travis because he's not giving <laughs> up. Because <laughs> otherwise, it just keeps yeah. bugging. <laughs> You're just going to be bugged for a while exactly. if we don't just do this. But yeah. but there was no sense of you being anything other than someone who was persistent. You know. Yeah. 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 So that that's the that's the biggest thing is that I find that a lot of people. Not a lot of people, but some people who are persistent do it in such a just like a nagging kind of a way. Well, what, we get letters. Difference? Someone will write me and ask me to do something like write a forward for their book, and I, mm-hmm. I say no to eighty percent of that. Yeah. I, number one, their title doesn't inspire me. I don't think mm-hmm. they've got something unique or whatever it might be. And then I get a nasty email that says, "You people all teach people to ask, 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 and then when someone asks you, you say no. What the hell? You know? <laughs> it's like." I'm going to write another book because we wrote a book called The, the, the Latin the Factor book. about how to ask for and get what you want. Mm-hmm. The next book's going to be called How to Say No. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no but, kidding. But people, they there's a lot of entitlement where people think mm-hmm. they're supposed to get. In fact, yeah. there's a, I don't know if you've seen Simon Sinek's talk about the, the uh, millennial generation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How yeah. they're all entitled to get every, whatever they want right now. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's it's great to be perseverant. But you start getting angry at the people you want something from. Yeah. I was just watching... 
I had another embarrassing moment. My wife watches The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, and sometimes Mine if too. I want to hold her hand, that's what I got to do. <laughs> <laughs> and so, don't lie. You you get into it a little bit. I do a little I, bit. I yeah. get attached to the people. <laughs> yeah. And and there was yeah. this last show that we just watched. It was these two guys, and they got into a fight with each other uh, in Virginia. They were doing like a, a presidential debate thing that mm-hmm. they had them do. Yeah. And they were so negative. Everyone just went ooh, and she kicked them both off the next show. Really. You know, uh, negativity does not get you anywhere. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. That's so true. Oh, well, we we definitely keep talking about the persistence thing, and I'll probably circle back to it at some sure. point. Um, okay, so now Chicken Soup for the Soul launches, and you guys just go into sales mode. Right. Another the the coolest thing about this is that the level of persistence that you guys had was just through the roof because it took you a long time to compile the stories, to have a partnership, to get a publisher to say yes to the book. Mm-hmm. And then you start selling copies at a decent rate, but it took you 14 months to get on the bestseller list? 14 months to bestseller list. Yeah, the book came out in July, and it was the following late September, the Washington Post, we hit 15. Yeah. And then maybe by November, we hit number 15 on the New York Times. Mm-hmm. And it climbed up like one number every week until mm-hmm. it got to the top, and then it stayed there for three years. Three years, is that some sort of a record? I I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. I mean, I know that um, in terms of how long it took, I'm not sure. I know that uh, Tim Ferriss was on the list longer than we were at the top. Oh, um, for so, a four-hour work week? Yeah, okay. he stayed there for a long time. Okay. The longest ever was uh, Scott Peck, who was on for 12 years in a row. 12 600 years. and some weeks. Wow, um, wow. But here's the, here's the thing, and, and we asked him, because remember, ask the people that have done yeah. what you want to do? Right. So we called... Uh, um, John Gray and Barbara DeAngelis and um, um, Ken Blanchard and Scott Peck, who'd all been on the best artist for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what Scott said is you got to do at least one radio interview every day. And he said the first year, do three. He wow. said the best ones are hour longs, like what we're doing here, because mm-hmm. you can delve deep. Mm-hmm. But the drive time stuff in the morning when you get the most listeners is usually on your five minutes, you know, and you got to have wow. your gig done. For us, it was what two stories we can tell that really blow people away, yeah, yeah. you know. And so we did that for three, three a day, three a day. And wow. quite often, there's this thing called um, satellite tours, where you're in a studio or you're on your phone and you have someone monitoring the phone. And the next thing, your phone rings. Hi, Jack. You're going to be on in Dallas in five minutes with so and so. And then you get off, and then two minutes later, now you're going to be on Arizona. Wake up, whatever. Wow. And either you're doing it in a studio with cameras, or mm-hmm. you're doing it on the radio. And we used to get up at. Um, three in the morning to do shows starting on the East Coast at six, and then you wouldn't be done until maybe 9.30 or 10 here because you're going all the way across the country for that wow. time. And you might do 20 radio shows in one wow. morning. <clears throat> that is quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have, you found, have you found that the podcasting thing is a little bit easier? You can dial in remotely and Podcasting is easier, and you can do it ahead of time, and you can yeah. record stuff right, like we're right. doing and so forth. So it's much easier, and I think... You know, what we also learned is book signings, like you do much, you get much more reach with podcasts and webinars and things like that mm-hmm. than we traveling all around the world doing book doing signings. Book tours and yeah. everything. Yeah. Now it's more like virtual book tours, virtual right? Virtual book okay. tours. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul comes out, you guys are crushing it and you hit the, the best selling list. After a while, um, I was reading some stuff, uh, before I prepping for the interview and you said that you started getting sick of hearing the story of the guy with no leg that climbs Mount Everest. And, right. and so at this point, this is where the um, uh, Canfield training group kind of came out of the woodworks. Is that right? Or is that kind of well, what happened was we were, I think, I don't know, 12, 15 years into the whole thing. And, okay. um, and there was, he started to get a little jaded, like stories that should have inspired me weren't. Yeah, yeah. Like we had a, a phrase called MFG stories, messages from the grave. Okay. So my mom died. She loved bluebirds. Yesterday a bluebird landed on my windowsill. I knew it was my mom kind of thing. Yeah. And it probably was. Yeah. But it's like, eh, no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like I just started to feel like this isn't doing it for me anymore. And, right. and I think one of the things you have to do in life is realize that sometimes what your passion is changes. Mm-hmm. You know, you've done whatever you were meant to do or learn whatever you were meant to learn from it. And not, I mean, you have to explore that because sometimes it's just you're burned out and you need right. a vacation. Mm-hmm. Um, but my CEO at the time, our CEO at the time, who's now our CEO in this company, said, um, you know, I think I can sell this company if you want to sell it. 
And I said, well, we'd have to get this. I didn't really want to, mm-hmm. but I said, if you can get this much money, I'll consider it. And he went and did it. So then it was called like, well, okay. <laughs> and so it allowed Mark and I to kind of just kick back for a year and decide what we wanted to do next. Okay. And out of that came starting to do more seminars and then the Success Principles book that I wrote. There you go, yeah. So this 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 book, I mean, Chicken Soup for the Soul is is a must have like on your library shelf for all the inspiring stories. Yeah. But, the whole series. I mean, there's there's over 200 books in the series. Yeah, which is crazy. And if you're a woman, you should read Chicken Soup for the Woman Soul. If you're African American, yeah. you should read Chicken Soup for African American Soul. Yeah. We had nine teenage soul books. Nine teenage ones. Nine teenage soul oh. books, you know, and like Teenage Soul 1, 2, 3, then Teenage on the Tough Stuff, you know, Boyfriends, Drugs, Abusive Parents, wow. Rape, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that there's there's probably everyone there's probably 10 books that everyone should read because of your interest like mm-hmm. we did chickens yeah. for the baseball fan soul with tommy lasorda the oh, dodgers really? coach you know wow um but the first book is probably the most powerful book because okay. that took 20 years to collect those stories and the rest of them a year or two yeah know? yeah totally totally so you come from that and then you go into the success principles so before it was like compiling stories that you were used to telling in all these different, you know, scenarios. And now you're going into like a purely content driven right. piece of work is really what it is. I mean, I, I was talking to somebody earlier and they, they were asking me about, it cause I was telling them I was prepping for the interview. And, um, I was like, yeah, as the author of chicken soup for the soul, the success principles. And they're like, Oh yeah, I've heard about that one. Is that a pretty good one? And I was like, bro, you have to read it. Like, it's like a, yeah, think and grow rich. It's like a, how to win friends and influence people. Right. And then the success principles, right. like you got it. It's one of the books that you do. So talk, talk to me about the difference between, um, your experience, um, putting together chicken soup for the soul versus putting together the success principles. Well, chicken soup for the soul was there were stories that other people had either said, written, seen in a, you know, interview somewhere mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah. Uh, other keynote speakers had them and I, can I have permission to use that story? And they said, yes, kind of thing. Um, with the success principles, I had to sit down. And this is the thing I'll just tell you as a little prologue. I wanted to write a book about success because everyone was asking me how did I become so successful with all this success. And I, didn't want to, I wanted to stop talking about it. So I said, I'm mm-hmm. going to write the book that says everything I know about yeah. it, and then I'm done. And then when they ask me, I say, go buy my book. <laughs> and then I'm going to go on to spiritual things or something. You know? Well, I learned you cannot write a book and then not spend the next 10 years talking about it because that's what everyone wants you to yeah. come talk about. But that's okay. But um, So I, I sat in bed one morning. I said, okay, how have I been successful? And I, I listed 114 principles. Wow. And, and then I... My wife looked at it and said, you can't do a book with 114 principles. There's way too many. Um, and I thought each one was going to be three Mm-hmm. pages so like maybe do 100 it'd be a 300 page book well yeah. it took 10 15 pages sometime to do a principle i combined some i dropped some out yeah, yeah. someday i'm going to write a book called the lost principles kind of like the, mm. the lost sea yeah, scrolls yeah. you know yeah. the, the bible what you don't know <laughs> yeah there you go. the missing principles but um anyway i wrote what i teach you know, first I've been teaching it for years. So I just kind of wrote what I taught. And mm-hmm. I think it's a great thing. If you can go teach it for a while, it clarifies it when people ask you questions and so forth. And then I did illustrate almost every principle with a story. Mm-hmm. Someone who had lived that principle and that because of it, something magical happened. Yeah. And so I tell people, even if you're writing a how-to book, put stories in there. It's the combination of the inspiration and the information mm-hmm. And then the person has to provide the perspiration, you know, to, to make it happen. But mm-hmm. if they're not inspired that someone else actually did it, mm-hmm. then often people don't realize how important it is. Yeah. Now, when it's we too do, abstract. Yeah. Like it's up here in the clouds. And, and here's another thing I learned. The, the first book, almost all my stories were about people you would know, like Steve Jobs or, you know, Bill Gates or whatever. So people go, wow, these guys are successful. That principle must really work. Mm-hmm. Some people didn't have that response. Some people, well, Bill Gates is like a, yeah. from another planet. That works for them. It works yeah. for them, exactly. So the second book, when we did the 10th anniversary revised edition, mm-hmm. almost, I'd say, 85% of the stories are people who read the first book and applied the principles. Oh, really? And that worked for them. A plumber, a teacher, that's a guy awesome. that was a real estate agent, whatever. And then, so people go, oh, that's much more relatable to Yeah, them. right. Totally, totally. Of the success principles that you that you have in the book, which one means the most to you? So not necessarily like, not necessarily your favorite, or I'm not making you pick one that say like, that's the only one you should do, but in your life, which one do you think you would attribute the most of your success to? It's a good question. Um, 
I'm going to answer with three because I think without them it's just not possible. Okay. One would be the take 100% responsibility. Mm -hmm. And this whole model I have of E plus R equals O of M plus response equals outcome. And if you don't get the outcomes you want, quit blaming the event. Change the response. Mm -hmm. You know, complaining is a sign of weakness. Solution is a sign of wisdom. You know, mm -hmm. so always go, how can I change the outcome? I'm responsible. What, what did I do there? What can I do differently? The second one would be, um, you know, uh, go within, which is the meditation part. Mm -hmm. Because I've gotten every great breakthrough, like creating the Transformational Leadership Council, which is we'll talk about with networking because it's my main network. Um, that came from a meditation to do. Mm -hmm. uh, the title of Chicken Soup, the idea to write the success principles, et cetera. And the third one is action. Is you, you've got to act. You have to respond to the feedback from the action because not all actions work. Mm -hmm. Most people are defensive to feedback. And then persevere. So those are all aspects of act action. Mm -hmm. The take responsibility one is probably the biggest in the last three, four years for me, like mm -hmm. probably the biggest uh, game changer mm -hmm. um, it was, was that one. And it's been incredible how things start to change when you right. take the responsibility. Can you talk about the difference between taking fault and responsibility? Is there a difference there? Can you yeah, a lot of people get uncomfortable with responsibility because it means like it's my fault or I'm responsible. Like if I got raped and I'm responsible or if I, you know, my business partner ripped me off and I'm responsible, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you look at, if you take, if you start with the assumption that everything that happens to you, there's some aspect of what you did. I just watched a movie with Joaquin Phoenix recently. It's about a cartoonist named Callahan. Mm -hmm. and, Joaqu and Callahan was a quadriplegic for a while and he got he was in a car and our guy was driving it they were both drunk and the guy totaled the car and Callahan became a quadriplegic and for years he was blamed the other guy mm -hmm. and his AA sponsor in the movie makes him realize well you're the one that got in the car you knew he was drunk you know you're the one that did it right and so there's some aspect where you either knew something and didn't act on it, had an intuition but didn't trust it because it was inconvenient, it was uh, going to be like a insult somebody, whatever it might be. So if you just look and say, if I was, if I did contribute to this being the way it is, what might be there? And when you look, you often find something, mm -hmm. almost always. Yeah. And the great thing is if I created it, I can uncreate it and recreate it differently in the future. So it's not about blame. It's not about you're a bad person. It's it's just simply called. If you don't want this to keep happening in your life, bad relationships, no money, sick all the time, not you know whatever, not having a job, then look and see what is it that I might be doing. Right, right. Most it's, people want to blame him, her, them, God, because it's so much easier sure. than trying to do it yourself. Yeah, yeah. And, and 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 the and the hard part is changing your behavior once you realize it, hmm. because you've got these limiting beliefs, you have these fears, you have the conditioned programming that goes on you. It takes work. Yeah. Real work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you do what you always do, you're going to get what you've always gotten. Absolutely. Yeah. As so much, so much of that kind of stuff is, is, is exactly what, is exactly what I've been trying to like put out to my audience recently is yeah. a lot of the taking responsibility and, and, um, uh, there's so much great stuff about that real quick. Let's touch on the, the E plus R equals O sure. and then we'll head into the networking conversation. Sure. Okay. So Everything you're currently experiencing in your life is an outcome of how you responded to something earlier. If you ate that cake last night, you might have put on a half an ounce of fat when you were sleeping last night. If you said something smart-ass to somebody and it cost you a job, a consulting, a girlfriend, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. you're the one that did that, you know. So it's to look at if I'm not getting what I want right now, what am I doing or have I done that's producing this outcome? So it's, there's, an, there's an event that takes place. I give you a $2,000 bonus. You go to Vegas with your friends. A year later, your net worth is still the same. Mm -hmm. I give you a $2,000 bonus. Your response is to put it into an investment account. You buy some Apple stock with it or whatever. Your net worth is $2,200 higher now. You know? mm -hmm. so, and the same thing is true. With, with everything that happens, you have a choice about how you respond to that event. And... I often always say in my seminars, uh, how many of you women would get upset if your husband forgot your birthday? And, and all the hands go up. And I say, well, what would you have to tell yourself? Well, someone, my husband doesn't love me. Well, how do you know that someone who loves you just forgot your birthday? You know, now you should be concerned, not upset with them. You know? yeah. And so... And then how about you giving little clues, like my birthday's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a circle on the calendar. Yeah. Yeah. But see, what happens, there's three responses you have any control over. One is your thoughts. So if you think my husband doesn't love me, 
you know, one of the things I teach couples is a set of principles. One of them is called, no matter what my partner's behavior, I'll assume it's, however troubling and, dis- and disconcerting it is, I'll assume it's the behavior of someone who loves me. That changes everything in a relationship, just mm. that one change of thought. Yeah. Now, the other thing you have control over is your um, physical, the things you do, your mm-hmm. actions, yeah. which includes what you say. And the third thing is your visualization, your images. So if I say, we're going to get up and dance, and some people go, oh, I'm going to want to do that. They're imaging being a lousy dancer. Right. Or they're remembering a time when they got teased as a kid because they couldn't dance or they fell down on the dance floor or whatever. And so we can change our images but by intentionally choosing to visualize something else. All fear is self-created by imagining something bad happening in the future. It hasn't happened yet. Right. You know, right. so I can start visualizing the worst scenario. Yeah, so now I can start visualizing the best scenario. Yeah. Now that takes awareness called that's, oh, I'm doing that. That doesn't work. Right. I've got to do this instead. So images, thoughts, and actions are the only three things we have any control over. And so when you can learn to change those and study the actions, the thoughts, and the beliefs, and so forth that people that are successful have, yeah. and then use affirmations and self-hypnosis and all the kinds of things you can do to change that, your life radically changes. Yeah. And there, uh, there's so many things popping in my head to kind of go along that same route, but it but is this Build is Your a, Network podcast. This is not a mini-series. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we do need to jump into that, into that right. portion of the conversation. So I told you this a little bit before we hit the record button. Yeah. Um, I spoke with uh, Dr. Ivan Meisner, the mm-hmm. um, CEO or CVO, excuse me, now of uh, BNI, father of modern networking, CNN calls him and stuff. And mm-hmm. I asked him who the best networkers were that he knew. And two names came up. One of them was Sir Richard Branson and the other one was Jack Canfield. And from that point, that was back in September, like we were kind of just talking about. And from that point, I was like, man, I really got to get this guy on my show. What do you think? makes you that way is it something that is just comes naturally to you to like really communicate no. with people or is it you had to work no it was not natural i was very shy as a kid um if i didn't have a lab class with a girl in college i never would ask her out for a date we would <laughs> stand next to each other for a month you know kind of thing. um so no i was not naturally a networker um but what I learned early on as I started to work with Stone and people like that was, you know, uh, who you know is as important as what you know. Hmm. And I really started to intentionally go to things and to meet people okay. that were either people that I knew could help me because they were like minded mm-hmm. or because they had access to large groups of people who might be interested in what I was about. You know, yeah. so I started attending conferences and going to workshops and going to church on Sunday, even though I wasn't like really super into church. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, and I did enjoy it when I go, but I would meet people there and I would reach out to them and I started introducing myself. Um, one of the things Ivan Meisner teaches is whenever you go somewhere, act like a host. Hmm. In other words, if you come into my house, I'm going to go, hey, Travis, welcome. Here's my wife, Inga. This is Patty, you know, whatever. But often we'll go to a networking event or any event that could be a networking event like church. And we'll wait for something to happen. We'll start pretending it's your church. Now, Hmm. someone walks in. Hey, I'm Jack Canfield. How long have you been going here? You know, blah, 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 whatever. Now, that changed everything for me. Wow. Yeah. Is that something you picked up from him? Like when I, I, I think I picked the general idea up from someone else, but I never okay. had it stated articulated yeah, the way he did it. And once he stated that, I did it much more aggressively. Yeah, more on purpose. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. So it brings me to a great question. This is the question I ask every single guest that comes on the mm-hmm. show. Um, I'm really interested to hear um, your perspective on it since you're very well, you're very well educated, very well, obviously spoken, best selling author, mm-hmm. all, like one of the best of all time. Uh, so you have a lot of knowledge, but you also have a fantastic network of people around you. Right. So I'm really curious to hear what your answer is to this. Do you believe that what you know or who you know is more important and why? That's like me asking, do I believe your heart or your lungs are more important? <laughs> <laughs> they're both essentials. I, I yeah. think they're both important. And I'm going to add a third one that you didn't ask. Okay. But I think I think what you know is critical and you need to know something worth value. You know, mm-hmm. Again, to quote Brian Tracy, you want to be you want to get more money, then provide more value to more people. Hmm. And so provide more value to the people you're already working with and then provide figure out how to get reach more people and provide value. Um, and so you have to have expertise of some kind, whether it's knowledge or a skill like a surgeon or a chiropractor or whatever. Know your trade, know your craft, know your profession and keep getting better at it. Tony yeah. Robbins idea of constant never ending improvement. Critical. The second thing is if nobody knows you're good at it, it's useless. So <laughs> you've got to network. Yeah. You've got to do all the stuff, the social media, the referrals, the, the you know, 
podcasts like this, whatever, so mm -hmm. people find out about you. Um, and you need to study those things or have someone on staff that's really going to you know do that. Like I've always had PR people that I've worked with. Um, before that, I did it myself. I read a book on public relations and did it. Mm. Um, I actually have a public relations award. Really? <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Separates you for a little bit, yeah. Yeah, but the point being that you, you, you have to do both. Mm. And the third thing I think that's critical is you, you have to focus on your being. Because you could know a lot of stuff and network with a lot of people. But if you come off like a jerk, if you're not compassionate and loving and caring and, um, you know, someone that people go, wow, that he, I like his energy. Yeah. You know, I mean, the two people that are filming this that came into the room today, I looked into their eyes and their eyes are like glowing and sparkling. <laughs> and so I go, wow, these are great guys. So instantly, if you have that, you're in a whole new space. And if you don't. Yeah. And also we know from the law of attraction that your vibration attracts as much as the information and the other things do. So it's, for me, it's all three. Yeah, uh, it's got to be present for sure. Every one of them. If if we were sitting down in like a in just like this in a mentor mentorship type of a, a mm -hmm. situation, and I was like, "Hey, Jack, I, I really I have some resources and some time and energy to focus on one of those three things this year. Mm -hmm. Which of those three would you say like you should focus a lot of time doing this?" See, I would go back to the same thing again. It's got to be all three. Yeah, like I take one of the things that you're going to ask me, I think, about my morning routine if we ever get there, but yeah. I, I divide it into three parts. Okay. There's 20 minutes of, of, of aerobic exercise and weightlifting, there's 20 minutes of meditation, there's 20 minutes of reading. So it's information, it's vibration, and it's physical health in that mm. sense. You know, Now I could add another yeah. 20 minutes and make five calls to network with people or send out five right. emails or whatever, which I do by the way yeah. <laughs> um, yeah you know just this morning i found something one of my friend's wife has cancer and i'm reading my cnn app and there's a new thing where electro pulse vibration a million vibrations per second wow they're, they're putting them on these cancer tumors and they're basically disappearing because no it, it gets them so hot that they can't stand it cancer cells can't live above 109 degrees wow. and so this vibration like you know your microwave takes it up to that so i sent it to my friend yeah. And that's one of the things I do because mm -hmm. it's, it's so anyway, I keeping people in the, yeah. In the, in the it's picture. It's kind of like, yeah. it's like you have a right leg and a left leg. You need them both <laughs> to walk. So yeah. I don't want to discount either one. I know we're here talking about networking. Networking is critical, mm -hmm. but so is it getting better at what you do and also growing yourself. So you're at a higher level of beingness. And you, you've done a lot of work with building self-esteem, mm -hmm. with growing self-confidence. Mm -hmm. um, but then you're also talking about how your vibration matters a lot when you, when you talk to people. It and you, you, you see, like you said, with, with their eyes lit up and all that kind of right. stuff. How do you balance becoming more confident without crossing the line into being like cocky and arrogant? Because that was one thing that one reason that I wasn't confident growing up. So I was always super afraid of people thinking that I was going to be really cocky and arrogant. Mm -hmm. So I would just like. I would just talk, it would be negative self-talk is what it would be. It was just like, no, you're not that good. You're not that right. good. You're not that good. And, um, but I know that there's a balance there and it's something that a lot of people struggle with, including myself for a while. Well, true confidence is not arrogant. It just, if you were truly confident, mm -hmm. arrogance doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. It's people that aren't confident and I'm not going to name names right now, but we have a lot of them in our public sector these days who are mm -hmm. not confident. And so they're very arrogant. They're always over pushing their message themselves, mm -hmm. trying to compensate for this inner sense. I'm not okay. I'm not enough. And so confidence comes, confidence comes from two places. Number one, when you realize that you're a spiritual being, that's, that's like realizing that nothing can harm you. Like bullets mm -hmm. go through you. I mean, the, the matrix, you know, yeah, that, that yeah. kind of thing. That's what they're trying to teach people. But the other place that confidence comes from is surviving a risk. You went door to door selling stuff mm -hmm. and you were risking re rejection, your own sense of approval and competence and all that, but you survived. Mm -hmm. And the more you survived it, the more confident you became. Guys that can easily go up and introduce themselves to women, they had to risk it the first time. Yeah. You know? Um, and some people do come up, they're too arrogant, and then women get turned off. Yeah. That guy's a, an a hole, they'll right. say, you know, whatever. <laughs> and so yeah. it, it's, it's a matter of just knowing that you are enough. And that you're okay and what you care about is okay. And also knowing that everybody is not going to buy or want to be with what or who you are. Exactly. That, that was the biggest realization for me yeah. when I was kind of wading through all of that was realizing that, that I would have to be okay 
if people perceived me to be that way. And right. I would just have to be okay with it. Like I, right. I, it doesn't, I can't, I can't control how they perceive me. Very I can true. just be who I am right. and say like, I'm presenting myself as a person, as a being. And if they don't, ex- right. if they don't want any part of it, they don't want any part of it. And you know what happens when you stop worrying about what other people think and just be yourself? The people that would be attracted to you and what you have get it because you're not hyping it. You're just mm. you're just really at peace with it. You're you're vibrating it. You know, yeah. and they go, "Wow, he's really into that." You know, and if they're interested in that, then they want to play with you. Right. right. And so often we're pushing it that the people that would be responsive to us pull away. Yeah, that's so true. And that 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 was that was a big big cornerstone for me moving forward was just realizing that, you know, in the end, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> you know, like I'm going to yeah. be me, and I have to be okay with some people not liking me, but it's, yeah. uh, it's sometimes it's diff- it's a difficult pill to swallow to, to, you know, the fact that you knowing that, that somebody's not going to like you. And at well, first it's part of growing crippling. up, you know, yeah. I mean, literally that's an adolescent mentality because mm-hmm. like when we go to high school and mm-hmm. middle school, that's what everyone's concerned about. Right. Uh, but as you get older, you have to realize, I, I love this. There's a woman, there's a book called, uh, when I grow older, I'm going to wear purple or something like that. And this woman, there's one of the quotes in there is something like, you know, I spent all my life worrying about what other people were thinking of me. And when I got older, I realized no one was thinking about me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they were all wondering what I was thinking about them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what was the rule that you, that you have? Like the, the when you're 18. Yeah. I yeah. forget the exact, I'm paraphrasing yeah. cause I don't remember the exact right. things. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, that's so funny. Well, Jack, I honestly, I could talk to you about this kind of stuff for a really long time. And, uh, I'm going to ask you one more quick thing about networking because sure. uh, I want to, um, keep my promise here and go back to that mentorship conversation sure. that we we're having at the beginning. Sure. Um, then we'll move on to the next segment. So, um, I, I know that, I know that mentorship was a really crucial aspect for you, um, mm-hmm. in your personal development and self-development. How does somebody go about finding a mentor, like somebody like the people that you were rubbing shoulders with? You said you could go to Ogmandino's office and talk with them and, and stuff like that. How, how, do, how do people find that? And are people too afraid to leave their comfort zone to go find something like that? I think, first of all, you've got to find who are the people that are doing what you want to do or know the things you want to know. Hmm. And I, don't start at the top like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, who's not with us anymore. But, but, but you, you have to be... You always want to go at least one level up. Mm-hmm. But you yeah. try to go five levels up. Like some people want to come and have me mentor them. They don't know enough yet for me to do that anymore. Right. You know. Right. Whereas twenty years ago, we were. I wasn't that far ahead of them. Mm-hmm. And so, um, y- y- and the other thing is, if you're really passionate about what you do, mm-hmm. I see the fire in the eyes of some people. To remind me of who I was when I was younger. Mm-hmm. So by all means, ask. There's, there's never any harm in asking. Yeah. But also, tell the person why. Why do you want to work with them? You know, what do you bring to it? Let them know that you're going to be someone who will put into practice what they teach you unless it's unethical or it goes against yeah. everything you believe. Um, because if I give you advice, you don't use it. Why, am I, why are we right, talking? Just you waste know? Of time, yeah. And the other thing I always tell people is, is ask for 10 minutes a month. Can I get 10 minutes of your time? Can I just call you once? 10 minutes. Invariably, that 10 minutes turns into longer. Mm-hmm. You know, I've had people that I've gave 10 minutes to and we were on the phone for half an hour because it was really valuable. <laughs> right. Sometimes I like them so much, I say, why don't you come shadow me for a day? Mm-hmm. Now, I don't, as you're watching this or listening, I don't do mentorship anymore mm-hmm. except with people that are my students that are paying me, not yeah. because yeah. I'm mercenary, but <laughs> because they're the people that most yeah. need my help because I'm they're learning right. to do what I teach. And so I want them to be really good at it. You only have so much time. Exactly. And, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But ask, 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 you know, you ask 10 people, you get one yes, that's all you need. Mm-hmm. Um, how many I, mentors would you say is like a good amount to have at any given time? Depends on how many things you're interested in. Okay. Do you need it's a fine, mentor yeah. on financial investing? Do you need a mentor on being a better husband, wife, parent? Do you need a mentor on marketing? Do you need a mentor on how to be a better coach? You know, whatever mm-hmm. it might be. Yeah. So um, like sometimes I'll have two or three people that I call consistently about things that I'm working on because that's where I'm focused and need support. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and move on now to the last segment here, Jack, and you already kind of foreshadowed the, uh, some, one of the questions that we have, but it's something called something that I like to call the random round. Just a few really quick random sure. questions, quick random answers. You ready? This is like that TV show, uh, where the guy, uh, what's that called in New York with the actor, actor studio? 
Oh, yeah. Have you ever yeah. watched that? You know? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyway. It's go. exactly like that. Go ahead. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay, good. <laughs> now, uh, what profession, other than your own, do you think it would be fun to attempt? If I was younger, tennis, uh, given the age I am, movie director. If you could sit on a park bench with someone, past or present, and talk to them for an hour, who would it be and why? I want to have Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad together, and I want to find out what they agree on and what they don't. How do you like to consume content? Books, audiobooks, blogs, podcasts, videos? Experiential workshops where I actually go through a process of doing mm-hmm. something and have an aha moment based on what the exercise or the, the thing was. Books would be second. What is a book besides the one that we've talked about today that you would recommend people read? Wow. Um, there's that's one of those things where like 20 books jumped into my head. Um, I, one recently I read that was really good was The One Thing. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually interviewing uh, Jay Papazan at the end of the month. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's, that, that, that's a, one, of my, one of my favorites as well. Um, give us a glimpse of your morning routine. Uh, 20 minutes of meditation. Uh, after that, I come down and I do a blender drink with um, about eight or nine powders in it, protein, spirulina, all kinds of stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, then I will work out in my exercise room, minimum 20, usually 30 minutes. And then I will uh, take a shower, go to my office. I read for a half an hour, because if I don't, I will, I won't get it in. Hmm. And then I, um, that's, that, those are the, th- the main things I do. And the other thing I do, I think it's critical is I plan my day the night before. So when I get to my office, I already have not a to-do list, but time slotted, and so I know exactly what I'm going to do between 10 and 10.30, 11. So I get the most important mm-hmm. things done. What is your go-to pump-up song? Um, going to be starting something by Michael Jackson. <laughs> what is something that you were just not very good at? Anything that deals with math, numbers, finances. <laughs> um, I managed to get through college with no math classes. Right. And um, I have a really good accountant. <laughs> <laughs> That goes back to the outsource the things that you don't like or aren't Absolutely. good at. Absolutely. Absolutely. As we get everything wrapped up here, what is one place online where we'll be able to find you the most? Probably jackcanfield.com. Uh, jackcanfield.com and also uh, Facebook forward slash Jack Canfield fan. Perfect. Perfect. So jackcanfield.com, head over there. If you want to find out anything and everything about Jack and all the stuff that he does, uh, if, if you, if you are not currently following his stuff, you definitely should be go check out some of this content, reach out, say what's up. Tell me you heard about him here on the show. Jack, thanks so much for coming to the show today. Seriously had a fantastic time talking with you. My pleasure, Travis. It was fun. Thank you.